I'm recording the second part here. So I'm going to add the link to the working doc at the top of the library, part library page. So part library and then above that do working doc. Okay, so I just just pasted that in, so refresh the part library for the tablet page. Just click on the working doc up on top, and that should be openly editable. When we set up these docs, because we're working, many people make it in the share settings, make sure that is open for everybody to edit. So it's not editable right now, I'm changing the permissions to editable. Public on the web can edit save. So now you all can edit so we can go into, actually let's practice that so we can go into that doc, so please click in there. So we, we start with modular breakdown and, and do a simple diagram, okay, so like this is the screen, so join me in that doc so you can see what I'm doing real time on the screen. Um, yep, see someone joining, there's a screen, there's a case, you know, I could do a super simple <coughs> diagram. We can all edit this right now, so feel free to do so. Uh, there's going to be the camera module. There's a battery pack. There's a power power adapter. What else we got? Now we can break this down meaningful in. There's the boost converter, that means the from the battery pack to the power supply to the Raspberry Pi. The sketch you did, that was the, the PWM controller, right? Is that what you call that? Right. Yeah. Like the like boost the converter that takes the, the, the PWM power controller. The boost converter, so that logically, like we can actually line these things up here logically, but the boost converter stands between the battery pack uh -huh. and a Pi tablet. So we don't have the Pi tablet here yet. We've got a screen, we've got a case, we've got the, let's get the Pi. The screen is on top of that, the case is all around everything, so you can like maybe put that in the background. Um, in a different color, so that's the case. Uh, cam module, I mean that, that plugs, you can start drawing things like, okay, well how does the camera work? Well, it will have a will definitely be connected to the Pi somehow. So you can start drawing like things. You can start evolving this diagram so that it actually starts to make sense. But the power adapter, uh, that, that's kind of external and that that plugs into the wall and then goes to the power of the Pi. Uh, the screen connects, so you can start adding detail like the screen connects with an HDMI cable plus a USB cable for power. HDMI does not carry power. So there's actually two cables. Uh, there's a USB cable and a so a power cable and an HDMI cable goes to the screen. Uh, so th stuff like that. Um, things that need to work like the case is a big thing. The like like in terms of let's put them in red for the things that are active development items that we have to do a lot of work on to make this attractive. So the case is a big one. The battery pack is a bit, basically the case and the battery pack are like the two, two really important aspects of this. Uh, the screen is kind of self-contained. The Pi is self-contained for the. There's an so between each of these things is an interface. How do you interface the screen to the to the case? So after the modular breakdown, you can do a second page, which is interface design. 
So for example, you can see that, okay, the screen has such and such pattern for the bolt holes, like there's little bolts or uh, it has got little holes. So you want to define that and that becomes naturally your requirement. All right, so you got modular breakdown, then let's go into interface design because if you have modules you have to know how they fit together so you go into an interface design and the modular breakdown plus interface design will inform your requirement like the overall requ requirement that when we design something uh, we don't say oh this is cool or not like check it against the requirements so let's define the requirements um, they should be kind of be upfront. You, you have the first level of requirements, which is like, <coughs> this is a Raspberry Pi tablet that's designed for a film studio and has long battery life, etc. And you can get more granular. Um, so you can start, uh, but requirements, one is like general requirements, and then you get very specific on, okay, the screen has such and such bolt pattern. Uh, it needs to interface with the casing such and such. So let's duplicate that slide and, and come up with a third slide called requirements and then when we discuss we discuss requirements not what not argue like we argue requirements we don't argue like on a more personal level <laughs> and before requirements actually like you can also say well, then the requirement becomes unclear. Mm -hmm. uh, like, okay, how do we clarify requirements? Well, we have to check requirements against the higher level requirement is like the overall project. Like we're, we're doing OSE specif specification-based design. Uh, so, so on the requirement, you can say, go back to OSE specifications. And there's like a list of 100 items on the wiki that you have to check this against. So when you say, okay, I suggest this, then I'm going to ask you, how does that meet OSE specifications for product design? So first check, first check is OSE specification. Check and is. It, and like, what is that going to? What kind of? Can you give an example of what you're going to find in the OSE specifications, and like what question you might have that you would have to check. Mm-hmm. So so we begin with the OSE specifications page on the wiki, and take. And, and a lot of that is obvious, others are more subtle. So take a look at OSE specifications. This is like the overriding okay. big picture, including ethical components. Okay. There's a whole mm -hmm. page, and we have how many of them? We've got 60 of them. So, so, so like, I mean, the first one's going to be like modularity, scalability. Like, okay, first, let's look at okay. spec number one, open source. <laughs> so, uh, for example, if we select the Raspbian, that actually meets it because Raspbian is open source. <laughs> the, no, I get it. I Second one is distributive economics. So mm -hmm. actually, we're not. Yeah, I mean, that, this really informs like everything about the design. So distributive economics is that we're designing this as a collaborative project. So this goes back to our mission: collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy so, of so, abundance. So someone might be proposing a solution in there that just doesn't—it doesn't follow just doesn't core work. values, and doesn't, so you're like that yeah. doesn't work because it has to. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. Like say, oh, you have to use Rhino to use. You know, yeah, that would like say you have fail to use some, right, specification first. number one. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, yeah. and then there's point three, and this is actually you got to translate. Super cooperators, not superstars. So our best collaborators focus on collaboration, not on superior technical skill. Technical skill can be acquired more easily via super cooperator growth mindset. Okay, so one one ramification of that is that explains why we're using FreeCAD 16 versus 18. We're cooperating. It's lower barriers to entry on the FreeCAD 16. Yeah, you, you're welcome to use 18. Um, you might be incompatible on some things with 16. I can tell you more people are going to use FreeCAD 16 than 18 if they're starting from scratch, at least at the present level. Like, um, 
and we might change it as FreeCAD, of course, evolves. Um, but a lot of people always ask us, it's like, oh yeah, I want to use FreeCAD 18. And I ask, why? Well, it's got more features. And I say, we don't need those features. We don't, that's not necessary for our workflow. 16 is sufficient, it's got lower access barriers. So anyway, behind each of the specifications, there'll be like, I'll be able to argue and you should be able to start interpreting this to all the different design choices we make. Um, so that everyone starts working on a design that's more closely aligned. So low cost, yeah. Uh, you know, at this point, don't put like a thousand dollar camera on it, uh, which you could. Uh, put on a twenty-five dollar <coughs> camera to to meet the need of the film studio. Modular, so modular is down at number five. Yeah, I mean that's that's where we're starting with so so go through them I won't go through them all but d definitely do read them and then inform your requirement based on them so like right here you can probably put like 50 like take each specification you can write down okay so for that my requirement will be uh, the case is 3d printed that'll be a requirement that falls out of the specifications which which are uh, low access barrier manufacturing. So for example, it won't be injection molded. Mm -hmm. It's DIY distributed manufacturing. So here on the requirement, we can all go through this exercise and go through an extensive list of general requirements and then we could get specific on the parts that we're working with because um, those are the parts we have at hand, for example. Um, and then we can keep evolving this. So the requirements should, should keep evolving to refinement or possibly some changes but if you if you argue the requirement like you'd have to go back to argue the OSC specifications so kinda like you wanna like in the governance aspect you wanna say hey we're on the same page because we agree to the principles and therefore we can go along because a big part of any project or if you try to get large-scale collaboration we gotta get on the same page is what we're after if not then you just get fractionalization and all that um, and with OSC, that's we're trying to say, okay, we have a common collaborative platform where the principles are understood, so that's a natural culture that, that evolves from that whole process. So the Raspberry Pi can be an example of, of this starting to happen, like especially if we get all the students like in schools involved on this, like you know, we're starting to get into San Diego and other locations, etc. Um, it becomes more important to be clear on the on the requirements part of the culture. So yeah. It's regular. Yeah. I mean, I recently part of this thing in Boston. It's to put on the Boston Society of Architects and others collaborating to do a citywide 3D model. And they're asking for volunteers, like offices, to come in and, and do the pieces of the model. But they use like the newest version of Rhino, and like and you, that combined Grasshopper. But you have to, the, you know, they set up the code and everything. But you have to use the newest version of everything. And I'm like, that's extremely exclusive. You're trying to be collaborative about this process and have make it inclusive. Like it's like a, a gift to the community. Well, no one's going to be able to use it. The only ones, you know, it's only the yeah. biggest firms with the most resources and sort of extra time to yeah. have people working on it. It's I was really I'll say, yeah. yeah. So up. so go back to them. <laughs> hey, have you heard of FreeCAD? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They I'm should serious. Be able it's to, like I agree. They should be able to. It's it can make do it. it. It's accessible. Yeah, if you look at FreeCAD architecture, one of the lead developers is an architect, and they got some funky architecture stuff, including <laughs> building management, like oh, I'm sure BIM. Yeah, they, that's <coughs> coming in there. Uh, so yeah, that's it's really good. I mean, FreeCAD is just evolving. It's it's a matter of time before like I think it's going to become an industry standard. I mean, well, it's part of the everything that's open source becomes an industry standard. Yeah, so I think if if we follow that logic, it seems to me that FreeCAD will, in a few years, probably going to take a couple more years, will start, like, like for example, happened with already with Blender. Did you know that now Blender's become the industry standard for movie production? Like, hmm. holy cow, that's a fully open source piece of software. Um, this Blender. just happened like a year or two ago, like or something like that, Blender. Mm -hmm. So now it is becoming the de facto industry standard of special effects. Holy cow. Um, that's amazing. But I think the same is going to happen with, with FreeCAD, and uh, it's a matter of time. And you know, that's what we're doing. It just makes sense. It's open. It's extensible. Uh, it provides more value, simply. Mm -hmm. It's a question of how much value are you providing, and then 
collaborativeness because I mean as we go into the future problems become more complex you have to you want to collaborate more to solve them uh, so I think I think more collaboration is going to happen in the future the guys in um, if you read the literature just as an aside on on open source product development there's a page on the wiki called open source product development uh, you'll read that the leading thinkers are claiming that open source modular design is how products will be developed in the future. So, I mean, writing's on the wall for open source uh, getting into the hardware space, but not a lot of people know that because the future is not evenly distributed. So we want to create an evenly distributed future as part of our, uh, part of our work. So interface design, um, so we want to start with module breakdown. With the module breakdown, a thing that's, that we can do right now, we can keep working this document and all that, um, but to this, we should now start adding our names, like I'm going to do X and Y. So I'm, I'm working on a battery pack, so I'm going to continue that. I uh, just printed out a sample. I'm finding out that, uh, just in general, with the large nozzles, very difficult to do multiple hop. Like if you have, so I just did the battery pack, I had all these vertical little towers that were disconnected. Uh, when you do the hops, it does a lot of the stringing, so it's not easy for the big nozzle to do m like multiple hop kind of printing, like really, like little towers everywhere. Like that's hard. That's why it was hard to print the control panel. You you kind of need the smaller nozzles for that to get less stringing, or maybe like we just haven't figured it out. Uh, so for example, for my battery pack, I'm gonna lay it not vertically, but flat where those jumps are not necessary because those columns turn into lines so it'll be much less hops so you have to think about how you're going to print something but with a battery pack where it's like a, a large multiple of the same thing when you put it on your slicer uh, don't make it do a bunch of small hops um, lay it flat or otherwise uh, so that's the production engineering that has to be considered there if you're using the large nozzles. If you're using smaller nozzles, it will be much easier to do. But think about it as you're hopping on a bunch of piers and you have to land exactly on a small pier. <laughs> it's kind of hard. CAD parkour. Maybe you can do, CAD parkour, maybe to yeah. print your pen that you can change nozzles so you can see that process. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you want to do that? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. So Jessica hasn't seen nozzle changing, but yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, maybe like, I don't know that if you want. That one yeah. let's, let's do a point four and get let's this see thing. See if we can get it to work, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, like the, the dinosaur, dinosaur, the, the clamp. clamp. Jessica was doing, like, and the 1.2 nozzle, especially with the stringing effects, because there's a hop between, you know, every time you cross, I think there's a hop there. Um, yeah, so we, we can change this to small nozzles. So, but right now... Let's go into uh, start adding names to th to this. So so in this work breakdown doc, and I see only one more person in there. So um, for anybody else, um, part library for the Raspberry Pi tablet page working doc. Click that link. Um, so <clears throat> let's add names to this. I think people dropped, or we dropped. Um, so I'm going to work on, continue on a bat pack, or Jeremy's there. Mm -hmm. I'll put that up immediately, so I'm going to put my name to that. Because we have a project, and we have a team, and it should be transparent what everybody's working on, so I'm going to put that there in red. Um, so... I'll put other people. It's Jeremy, Don, How Jessica, Tom. If all these components are going to end up going together, yeah. How do you know how they go together? Yeah, I mean, this isn't software where you just sort of create an interface. You have to start deriving the interface. So slide two is the interface design. So for example, let's take an, take take one thing. The screen, you're gonna know that it has a certain bulk pattern. So on a screen has a certain bolt or mounting pattern. And particular cable arrangement. Outlets. There's 
uh, the particular cable arrangement, right? Mm -hmm. And particular dimensions. That informs your interface design. You're going to say, okay, so to if we're going to use the holes in that, there will be particular holes, and that's the whole pattern that has to be on the screen if we use, choose to use bolts to do that, or pegs or whatever. It'll be like the wire is going up, you know, say, some way. Well, I understand that. that so that's an easy version. So yeah. what about the battery and you the power to, booster? You have to go through all those things. The, the, in, you take the information you know about it. You take the information you know about other systems and start deriving specifics from that. So, for example, we know that the battery pack will mean that if you have a case, the batteries are 16, eight, 18 millimeters tall. And I made my battery pack 20 millimeters tall to house those batteries. So that will inform that your Pi tablet's gonna have to be that thick in order to house it, for example. Or you will s say that, okay, now this battery pack has this kind of terminal connection on it. That will inform how it connects to the Pi. So you just have to start looking at all the details and writing down a granular list of all that until the requirement is complete, so complete that it basically defines every single element about it, including dimensions and rounded corners or whatever, you know. Uh, like part of the requirements here is on the um, requirement page, I'm going to put in a requirement. It has a built-in camera holder mount. So that informs, okay, probably on the bottom, you will do that screw-in thing so you can use a regular tripod, you know. So make it so it's interchangeable, so it a, has a tripod mount built-in. And it sounds like uh, this is like, well, holy cow, where do you start? But you just have to dive into one. You take you start by, okay, I'm going to take my Pi. Okay, the Pi has the power cable like right on this side, so I need to move it to the edge of that, edge of the case, so that I can plug in my cable. Yeah, which is kind of my point, is that right now, as you talk through this, you yeah. are in the architect seat. I'm just it, making suggestions. I yeah. understand, but you are a single person who's making sort of architectural suggestions. If, if now there's 10 different architects, you have a system that doesn't necessarily move in some distinct direction. So a lot of this is going to depend on the orientation of just the board in its own housing. Yeah. Where are ports accessible? Yeah. What sides of this are going to be inaccessible? Right. Right? Yeah. If I'm not working on the pie board, I don't know what sides of this housing I have accessible to me to mount a battery pack to. Okay. Or that's, a camera. That's why we have this work doc and as soon as anybody has any information everything is documented. So then you look at so we can take this interface design page and now break it into five more pages <coughs> and say okay this is the pie. These, these are all my requirements. So then you have to refer back to that page. Um, in this diagram, in an interface design diagram, you want to make note of what connects to what. Like here I drew that the screen is like inside, symbolically inside the, the case. But you're going to know that if you're designing a case, what are you going to have to consider? You're going to have to look at the requirement from the screen person, uh, the camera person if we do that. Maybe like we, we save the camera for, no, you want to include it now because you don't want to have it as a dingleberry later. Or you, get, or you can say, um, we're going to in a, for example, in a, in a modular breakdown, we're gonna s or in the requirements that we're all looking at, we're going to say, okay, uh, let's take the cam. We're not going to worry about the cam right now because we're going to add a separate, like a bar here that just plugs into the case later. You know, mm -hmm. We can make those decisions. But this document needs to be broken down into as many documents as there are components, and each person that works on one, if you have a relationship to another one, you have to look at the other person's thing. And you can do that in real time. So you can be, uh, and you can be on a conference call and you know we're discussing stuff here, but the first thing is start documenting it so 
it's not ether it's actually turning into a design so you des you document it for requirements interfaces modules um, that degenerates the design into it funnels the design to okay this is the final product so everything you write down here is going to go towards that funneling process but in order for that to happen you have to document it and other people have to see it the dock is very convenient because you can have a hundred people on this I'm not, I don't know what the limit of a single dock is but it's convenient like we can do docs that are up to I would say like 50 pages and after that maybe link to another doc so it's not too cumbersome to manage one doc or maybe keep it to like 25 pages but here we can certainly break this down into each um, this interface design goes into interface design of five more and and we just keep going at it and the point is that it, to do that entire process it's a complex thing it takes a lot of work right but if you have a lot of people who understand okay now I'm gonna just take the screen I'm gonna take the screen I'm gonna draw out just an interface so for example it could be a free cat file where you draw the four holes as a sketch that's my contribution. So here, here's the link to an actual CAD where I started it. So then the person can take that and, and actually draw out, you know, put that on their case. They can copy and paste into their case, docu the, their case document. So you can all coordinate this because we have access to online repositories. So you've got the wiki, you've got these docs to coordinate. Uh, you've got FreeCAD to assemble using merge. You can simply merge parts from the part library and then the versions of the part libraries so it can happen it's but it i mean it's not an easy process this is like you really have to think about it uh, but think about it just like in software the modular breakdown idea we're just doing exactly what's happening in software i think where you're taking a thing and you got a requirement have you ever written you got, software with the team before though no i didn't didn't really um but i've done things like say we're doing code on the you know marlin you know we're changing our code, taking contributions and kind of like, not not really concurrently, but I mean taking versions and then saying, okay, here, this is the final version. Like one person might change actually one module of the code. Like say one person changed the mapping of the extruders. Um, then I say added, I changed the screen and we kind of put it together. So that's the kind of experience. But I mean, I think the principles apply, the specific tools, how we execute that might be a little different but um, this process should make, in theory, you can take a very complex thing. I guess that's what we're driving at. We're saying, we're going to take a complex thing, we're going to break it down as much as we can, and then go to town on doing the design. Uh, so it's a highly iterative process. It's a very test-driven process where it's like you're, you're looping through this all the time. You're checking other documents. Like, for example, the person prototyped the battery pack like, like I did, yesterday I found oh this doesn't work then you know document that put that under uh, say the part library SDL file the SDL file should have production engineering info like that's the most convenient place you got the SDL file you might want to capture a screenshot of all the parameters you did uh, and make production engineering notes so so there's a it is a complex process it's a, it's a lot of moving parts that are iterating constantly test driven design it's a uh, it's like agile waterfall in a sense, it's a contradiction in terms where a waterfall is the waterfall part is the requirements that come from top down of the project. Like, you've, we've got all these requirements that we have to adhere to. Agile is that okay, from that point, you know, we do it how we can, we, we iterate rapidly um, at that point. There is no like it's agile because the, the requirements are. We're not saying like you got to do this and this and that. We're saying, okay, these are general requirements. You got, we'll get out of the way and see how you can reach those requirements. So um, that's kind of where it is. Okay. okay. Let's try it. So, so from this interface design, like if I'm doing the backpack, I would I would put okay, interface design of the backpack. I would I would say, uh, here's my requirements and and design considerations that sh that you all have to consider. But we basically start, you know, start making this more more granular. Uh, add information to each part, which then kind of uh, directs the project in a certain way. You kind of say, okay, we're going to do this. Say, say I did the backpack, and it's like, oh, this is great. Those uh, 
the interconnection mechanism that I did with the bolts, that's simple enough and actually works, or we do something else. But if, if we feel we find something that works, people can decide, oh yeah, I want to try that. Or, and then if they prototype it, they say, okay, well, I want to fix that. Um, but we can have many people doing uh, different parts, like say Jeremy the Pi. Let's say, so Jeremy, like, what are you going to do on a Pi? Like maybe, I don't know, look at the details of it and, and simply make explicit the requirements of what how we connect to the rest of the system, right? Yeah, I thought I would start with the how it's going to mount and mm -hmm. build the okay. pieces that are going to go external into a mount drawing and then okay. get that up online so you guys can integrate that in with other pieces. Yeah. So yeah. kind of leave one piece, you know, one side open. I'm assuming it'll probably go on the back and the ports will all have to go out and the batteries will probably go on the side that has no ports. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I thought I would draw it like with how we're gonna like the piece of the case that goes with it, so you can then, you know, plug that in once you have a piece to set next to it and yeah. play with it uh, in CAD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And there's like top level decisions that as we go along, we can say, okay, it makes real sense to have the, say, the screen because. We're limited, like say we want to make this user friendly, like you don't want to make it into a thick thing that won't fit in your pocket, so make it, like one of the requirements at the top level would be, okay, try to make it as thin as possible. So for example, don't mount the pie behind the screen, because the screen already has thickness, and a pie has additional thickness, so you'll probably end up having a two inch thick tablet, which is not awesome. I'd like to put in my pocket, my leg, make it easier. So, but we have to determine that uh, as we go along, because maybe we say, well, for certain reasons, this is actually better to do it this way. Um, and we can start recording, like, let's say we can go into that requirements doc, just start writing stuff down in there. And another person can come in and they can say, uh, no, I want to scratch that out for this reason. We, we can do that, just feel free to do so. But then at the end, we can have discussions, design review saying, no, we actually all accept it and we're going to put a check mark to it and we're going to stick to it. Does so just keep the, going. Does that Google Doc retain versioning? Say, the way it does. It the, the versioning is completely there. So we leave this completely open. In the file, you have a version history and you can go, so you can even name current versions like, um, you know, start starting point version, right? At the, and the morning of the four days left in the camp. Um, you can go, like if somebody, we leave it very open, like completely open on the internet. We've never had problems with that, but if somebody wants, you know, trashes or makes some mistakes, you can go, um, if you see version history, you can actually restore. So, okay, there's the starting point, and now we've got the current version. We can simply say restore. There's a thing, rename, remove, make a copy, um, restore this version right there. Um, so it's really, really good. It has versioning history within the docs themselves. Sorry, so you don't have to worry. Yeah, uh, under file, there's a version history in a, in a Google Doc. So that is very convenient. Um, and basically for the document, like as soon as we reach, let's, let's make a requirement that as soon as we reach 25 pages in this doc, let's create a new one because it might start getting hard to navigate it very, very quickly. But 25 pages should be more than enough for now. And we can branch out to other linked documents or 25 or maybe a little more, but it depends on your internet connection. But we want to keep it that even if you have a slow connection, like you can work effectively here. So like 25 pages is, it depends how complex the pages are too but Google Docs load up pretty pretty well. Um, here, like for the top level, so we can do like top level requirement, then you can get, you know, copy and paste that, you know, down down here, we make that a little smaller here, make it like 12, because we're going to get a whole bunch of requirements. Then you can go into more granular requirements, uh, detailed requirements. Uh, but here, like in the top level, I want to, think about kind of like phone blocks so maybe the question is like phone block style that for example for the camera module you plug it into the side or do we just do it more monolithic but we want to go as as modular as possible with the constraints that we have maybe we have a snap in battery pack we we want to say oh we're gonna do the battery pack that you can interchange readily with another if you run out uh, so you know we can 
decide on that which which are good ideas and ideally that kind of a snap and thing yeah that would be cool but that's going to be harder to implement because uh, you've got more pieces to to think about so we can decide you know and then we can talk about version one ver version two and so forth so how this product evolves um, and we can say the top level requirement is this this product evolves forever you know the product is designed for designed to be modular and therefore evolve forever and constantly and continuously evolving we like that and then of course we can freeze it and make new versions and make like a stable release and so forth but design it so that you don't you're not limiting your ability to extend it in the future like don't design it for example right now that we're gonna say we're gonna get this manufactured in this uh, aluminum case which if you want to change something you can't change the case you got to go to like new production or something so yeah so we can do a lot of requirements and then detailed requirements so let's start going at it uh, one other I, thing before yeah. we break I just wanted to mention that uh, Google TensorFlow has been ported to the Raspberry Pi so this is image recognition software <laughs> and so uh, you know the mind goes wild what you could do with that my what I wanted to do is build my my weed picker robot to use Raspberry Pi to look at and recognize what's a weed, what's a, a plant that I want, mm -hmm. and to take out the weeds. So I'll just throw that out there if anybody's uh, into software development. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely like a whole vision <laughs> stuff is big. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. So. Alrighty. So let's let's check in at like one three four, yeah. Let's let's see where we are. See yeah. how far this evolves. So this is a live project. You know, we're gonna get as far in the four days as possible. But this is only the beginning too. We're gonna continue this in future steam camps. Not necessarily the next one. We're gonna continue this in uh, we can I would like to host some follow up design sprints where we say, okay, now we're here. We, we can do like a dedicated session of working on this with mm -hmm. all the people on a team like especially after everybody's up with their printers and we've got the battery packs worked um, out we might want to get together on and it's, uh, further yeah, design yeah, exactly. events around this and definitely future camps uh, other events if we get schools involved that's an amazing project for students to contribute to so this is only the beginning and we'll see how far we get in the four days okay so thanks a lot. We'll check in at 1, 3, and 4 U.S. time. Sounds good. See you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the image recognition and using AI...